folks tell me, how can a known poison that exists? To grow closer to the audience, because on television, you never know. You could have seven people. We've been blessed, you know. We could have uh, 700,000 people watching us a day, and there isn't that intimacy. I can't, uh, I can't communicate. I can't answer your questions. And remember, I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm answering questions within my realm of knowledge working with so many. Oh boy, if I, if I seem tall to you, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants who allowed me to try antifungal medicines and the results were spectacular. Felice wrote in just before we were ready to go home on Tuesday and I read it to you, my son had C. diff. Uh, C. diff is a bacterial infection. <clears throat> I got him on your diet. That was five years ago. He hasn't eaten anything off the diet since then. He's 21, beautiful young man, inside and out. She got him on my diet when he was 16 years old, uh, five years ago. So he was 17, 16, 17 years old. Imagine a 16, 17 year old being that sick with C. diff uh, that he would follow the diet. That's going in my testimonial uh, basket here, Felice, because, uh, let me put it over here because that's important. We have hundreds of testimonials now. Uh, I, let's talk a little bit about COVID, but before we do, I wanna talk about COVID, I wanna talk about C. diff, I wanna talk about malazia. You all know malazia, right? I wanna talk about a call I got from a dear friend just a couple hours ago, a 72-year-old guy who's so miserable with gout, he doesn't know if his life will continue. But I wanna preface all this because all this to me is about fungus. I pulled this out of the Harvard uh, Health Letter July 2012, not quite a decade ago. Rare fungal infection of the GI tract can mimic cancer and irritable bowel syndrome. And it's puzzling doctors how to best diagnose and treat it. The fungus called Basidio, bolus, is typically found in subtropical regions and emerging societies. But this spring, this was a decade ago, nine years ago, dozens of cases were diagnosed in the southwestern region of the United States. Symptoms for the infection are fairly nonspecific, abdominal pain or a mass that can be felt outside of the midsection. Most patients recovered with antifungal treatment or if necessary surgery. A rare type of cancer. It's mimicking, a fungal infection mimicking. I have studied fungus for almost 50 years. I find that it's the great pretender. Remember that song, who was that that sang that? Oh yes, I'm the great pretender pretending to be. Uh, it is. It can look like a viral infection. It can look like a bacterial infection. It can look like cancer and diabetes and gout and, you know, all of these things that I talk about here. So thank you for joining me today. That comes out of Harvard. They're aghast nine years ago. Imagine their IQ juxtaposed my IQ. Ah. They're probably double my IQ. And they're, yeah. I'm sorry, the, the platters. Oh, 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 yes. I'm the great pretender, pretending that you're still around. I love that song. I'm gonna play that on the way home. Get ready, Siri. Okay, here is Harvard doctors. <laughs> Did you ever see who, who wrote those jokes, these funny jokes? School of higher learning, all these very intelligent 10 and 11 year old kids, and they're running into their school. Uh, was it Wilson? Who was that guy? They're running into their school and a big sign on the glass door of the school says push. And they're all pulling the door. And that's sometimes the way I feel with doctors, folks. Very, very bright. But if you don't teach them exactly what they have to regurgitate for the next 50 years of their career, they're not going there. Continuing medical education should update them uh, during the, this COVID uh, problem we're having. Maybe a lot aren't going, I don't know. Most patients recovered from uh, this fungal infection that mimic cancer. How many people have been diagnosed, put on chemotherapy, and had the worst case scenario? So I wanna, on that note, I wanna start <clears throat> with C. diff. And I wanna teach you a little bit about C. diff. Okay, you are 70% more likely to get uh, Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, 
if when you're on antibiotics or the few weeks after you stop it, tell me it isn't driven by antibiotics. Just please, I'm not going to be mean-spirited. I'm going to be nice. Go with me here. Antibiotic induced, induced horrible problem that 500,000 people a year go to hospital. Ching. And 29,000 a year, over 2,000 a month, die of this Clostridium difficile. It's an, it's, they say it's a bacteria that antibiotics cause. No, no, no. Antibiotics kill bacteria. But antibiotics encourage the overgrowth of yeast. See, God put two types of organisms in our intestines, thousands of species of bacteria and candida, yeast, in our intestine. You begin randomly killing the, the greatest invention, the worst invention at the same time. 50, 80 years ago, antibiotic hailed as a benefactor of mankind. Did I ever read you that? Here it is right here. Let me read you this. I can't believe I have this book. And this wasn't, uh, I didn't set that up today to do this. John showed this book. This guy and I communicated many years ago, John Pitt, the genus Penicillium. I am the strangest guy you will ever know in your life. I didn't peruse this book, but I sure looked through it. I paid $1.98 for this book. It was originally, you know, one of those really expensive books. I want to read you what the wonderful John Pitt wrote in the opening. <clears throat> this is his introduction. It is ironic that this humbled fungus Penicillin, penicillium, the fungus, hailed as a benefactor of mankind, may by its very success prove to be a deciding factor in the decline of present civilization. I wrote this book, when did I buy this? I bought this so many years ago, 1979. In 1970s, this doctor was saying, whoops, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, people with bacterial problems, however many there are of them, and a doctor will tell you, everybody has it are getting better, but methinks we're making a huge mistake. I think we're going to hurt a lot of people by using antibiotics non-judiciously. We are. Imagine the doctors getting this information that they put, you know, every patient that walks in the door on an antibiotic, and now they're having a bacteria, a mutant bacteria growing that requires another antibiotic. Uh, here's what can happen. When you feed yeast after all your antibiotics with these antibiotics, it'll begin to grow. Now you have an overflow of a yeast problem in the gut that you're throwing the wrong medications at. And it's going to mutate the few bacteria that are left and accelerate the growth of the yeast. This is what happens. Oh, they'll never accept that long after I'm gone, maybe after you're gone. Some bright doctor will sit down and say, wait a minute, we give antibiotics to kill bacteria and we're causing a bacterial infection? That's not the way it works, folks. They just switch to another antibiotic. What do they have, a thousand of them? The prudent physician, I don't think they're there yet. They're not. The prudent physician is going to say, hmm, maybe the Center for Disease Control, Doug Kaufman, was right. 2017, 2018, 2019, before COVID, when they were telling the truth that if you're not doing well on antibiotics, ask your doctor for antifungals. Think fungus was their marketing plan. Why should a patient have to tell a doctor to think fungus? And yet that's what they were telling us. Doctor's not going to think that. He didn't learn anything about this in medical training. He believes C. diff is a bacterial infection caused by an antibiotic. Can you imagine? Well, MedPage today, <clears throat> uh, two and a half years ago, do fungi play a role in C. diff infection? Be still my heart. When I pulled this up a couple of years ago, I almost fell out of my chair. Patients with Clostridioideos difficile, now it's called Clostridium difficile, you change the name to protect the innocent bacteria. Infection had different bacterial and fungal composition in their stool compared with those of uninfect, uninfected patients. It, I couldn't, Sometimes Ruth will say, what's going on in there? I'm almost falling out of my chair. Every once in a while, they found statin drugs are helping COVID-sick patients. Why? 
Statin drugs kill fungus. Now they found Spornox is helping half of the people with. Folks, some genius is going to put it together one day. Sweep Doug Kaufman under the carpet. I could care less. I don't need accolades. I don't need a bronze star. Just take this information and help mankind. Because right now, you're the problem. Do fungi play a role in C. diff infection? Small study finds evidence of the role of fungus and what it might play in dysbiosis associated with C. difficult, C. Diff, difficile. Can you imagine this group of seven doctors? Wait a minute. How did fungus, we didn't learn this, it's bacteria, everything's bacteria. Now what's been done since? Oh, nothing. 29,000 more people will die this year. Half a million will end up in hospitals. They're not going to change, folks. They don't know that antibiotics don't cause bacterial infections. They learned antibiotics cure bacterial infections. So this is throwing them off tremendously. And then this, this I thought was so amazing. 25 years ago, 1996, what were you doing in 1996? Wow. 1996, I want to read you from a New Horizons journal, medical journal, August 4th, 1996. Does antibiotic restriction prevent antibiotic resistance? If we stop giving antibiotics, wouldn't we overcome the problem that is injuring and killing so many Americans, so many humans of antibiotic resistance. You see, if you throw too many antibiotics at this fungus, eventually the patient isn't going to get better on any antibiotic. Vancomycin is one of the antibiotics of, of last hope and it killed my father. You know, there it's their medicine. Great stuff, right? But, anti, but vancomycin might help a lot of people. Um, so it was asked 25 years ago, does antibiotic resistant, uh, I'm sorry, does antibiotic restriction, if we don't give people antibiotics, do they get antibiotic resistance? <laughs> no, they won't. Okay, but when we restrict antibiotics, it cures antibiotic resistance. It prevents it. Listen to their words. Antimicrobial resistance among some hospital organisms has increased to a stage where it can no longer be tolerated 25 years ago now. We're not going to tolerate this. Oh, really? The need for preventive and corrective measures is urgent. God, I love these people. How must they feel? 25, are they alive today? Their voice, urgency, it's not going to be tolerated anymore. Darn it, we're mad. It fell on deaf ears. There is an association between the use of antimicrobial agents. Let's cut to the chase. There is an association between antibiotics and resistance that is likely causal. Gee, do you think? Efforts to improve antimicrobial use through educational efforts alone have largely been ineffective. How many years? Decades? 1950s. I'm sure they thought, uh-oh, this is a good thing because it'll sop up the bad bacteria, the pathogens that are causing ear infections, throat infections, infections throughout the body. But is there a darker side to antibiotics? You didn't have to be a college student. Fourth grade, you could figure this out. Okay? What about, hey, Dad, what about the good bacteria that God put in our guts and on our skin? Well, antibiotics are going to kill that too. Then what happens, Daddy? Let's zoom ahead. 21 years. This is Pharmacy Practice News the other day. Antibiotics make the top five in Choosing Wisely campaign in 20... Good for those pharmacists. We're going to get... We're, antibiotics are such a problem, we're going to make it the top five that we're going to address in 20... <sighs> Unfortunately, it is up to you and me to know what's going on. There, you're going to get an antibiotic. 25 years after saying, this is intolerable. This isn't going to work anymore. Urgent need. Ain't going to happen, folks. 
your doctor learned to prescribe antibiotics for everything that ends in action, infection. You're going to get an antibiotic. But what, Doug, if you're right, and my pillow is 20 years old, and my mattress is 30 years old, and when I hit that at night, I breathe, and my sinuses are blocked up, and my eyes itch, and I go on the antibiotic. Some antibiotics have antifungal properties. So for a short period of time, you might take that acute sinus problem. Wow, that doctor's awesome, that ear, nose, and throat doctor. And for a week or two, but then bang, you're back on the pillow at night, and seven, eight days later, you got another infection. Go back to the same doctor. He'll look up, oh, I gave you tetracycline last time. Let's give you more tetracycline. And before you know it, your acute nasal problem is now a chronic nasal problem built by a well-meaning doctor who paid $250,000 for his education and didn't learn about the mold in your pillow or the mold in your apartment. Okay? So, do fungi play a role in C. diff? Unquestionably, yes. Can we move on now to something called malazia? Do you know what malazia is? Have I taught you about that? Oh, John. John made my... Uh, made my tea today. You did a magnificent job, John. Malazia is a dermatophyte. Malazia are uh, several of, I'm not, I can't get that, call them back later. Um, malazia is a yeast that grows on the skin. Clinical Microbiological Review, 1992, long time ago. Classically, Malazia yeast is associated with superficial infections of the skin and associated structure. Recently, however, there have been reports as agents of more invasive human diseases, including deep line catheter associated sepsis. People go in a hospital and in their urethra, they have a catheter so they don't have to get up and go to the bathroom, it just drains their bladder. But these catheters are made out of what, polystyrene? You think that's good to put on our skin? Um, and so you're vulnerable to a yeast or a fungal infection after you've had these catheters. I see a lot of yellow on there, John. Oh, yeah. Uh, SL, uh, 660 AM, The Answer. It's a radio station I listened to driving into work the other day when Mike and Mark were talking about uh, his surgery. After needing that surgery, short time after his vaccine. I don't know if there's a correlation there, but I reported it. Um, so they're now saying that this malazia might indwelling catheter may initiate fungal growth in your urethra, your urine tube, uh, from having a catheter in it. This is 30 some years ago. Harmless yeast. Malazia are skin pathogenic yeast that live on the dermal layers of 90% of animals and we humans. About a dozen species have been identified and several are linked to Tinea versicolor, skin patches discoloration, and seborrheic dermatitis, dandruff, these malazia. When I tell you folks that, you know, if you have seborrheic dermatitis, I saw it over and over. I saw it a hundred times from people who get out of the shower in the morning and they live in cold weather, so they put a a toboggan on, or they wear a baseball hat all day and they're working outside. You take that moisture and you seal it in and bang, you've got dandruff. You're just growing fungus. Malazia are the fungi that you're growing. But one year ago in 2019, scientists discovered that the yeast may play a much larger role in a much larger, even life-threatening health problem. <clears throat> This I put up on God TV a few years ago. Can a harmless yeast progress cancer? You've heard me say last Tuesday and a couple of weeks before that, that we now know yeast makes viral infections, uh, you know, uh, worse, right? Your, uh, one of them is HIV, AIDS. Another one is human papillomavirus. They increase the vulnerability of the virus to just take off, makes it more virulent. Yeast and fungus accelerates AIDS and human papillomavirus. And now we're hearing that a harmless yeast, we all have it on our skins, uh, progresses 
to a more serious condition. Let me read it to you. Scientists have suspected that viruses the impact of fungi on human health, this is directly out of Nature Magazine, I'm quoting, the impact of fungi on human health is understudied and underappreciated. One genus of fungus, Malazia, has now been linked to the progression of pancreatic cancer. And I found this on WebMD, Malazia yeast, much deeper than just pancreatic cancer. We have, long, uh, we have long known that Malazia fungi and yeast, generally found on the scalp and the skin, are responsible for dandruff and some forms of eczema, but recent studies have also linked them now to skin and colorectal cancer, says a study uh, done in 2019. I'm telling you guys, do you see where I steer this show? Um, my dentist, and his wife were uh, doing so, they cleaned and then examined my teeth. They didn't, but the hygienist cleaned my teeth yesterday. And then his wife walked in, a wonderful woman, and said, Doug, we watch your show, we love your show, uh, but what supplement do you like best? Which of any do we need? Folks, that's a thumbprint. Man, if you can't sleep at night, um, I like valerian root tea. I like uh, CBD, the right CBD. Um, you know, there are just so many things I like. I've tried them all. I sleep great, but I try them all for your sake. Which one, Doug, would you use? Which one? Is it the air cleaner? You know, is it Aloe Apex? Is it Poop Doc? Is it what, you know, Life Extension? Uh, I had a thought on Life Extension I want to share with you guys. Uh, I, I don't know, I will tell you of all of them, if I was on a ketogenic diet, if I wanted to try, if I was sick and my doctor said, why don't we try a ketogenic, a real ketogenic, a real keto, not what you buy in the store, a real keto diet, right? With the right amount of proteins, carbs, uh, et cetera, then I would use Alan's product, Keto Med. Um, but I'm a guy who's 71 years old, just ended up sweating a few minutes ago, uh, live a different, I don't drink, I don't smoke, you know. Um, so what would I take? The few times I have not taken beta-glucan, I suffered. And so my choice, this is what I tell them, what do you want? What, what problem do you have? Are you overweight? Okay, I'd look at diet. Um, do you have diabetes? Okay, I'd look at some other things. Um, do you have cancer? Do you, are you looking for optimum immune health? That's what I'm hunting for. That's what I'm hunting for. Uh, I've been to so many of these longevity meetings and talked to so many people and they all have their own thing, right? But I gotta tell you guys something. Unless you're eating properly, and I think I can help define what proper diet is. Anything that starves fungus, fungus will kill you. Harvard says it mimics cancer. Um, if you're taking the proper supplements, I don't know if my foods have, and I eat organically, I don't know if they have all the nutrients I need. So I take uh, a, a general, you know, uh, once daily or sometimes twice daily, nutritive supplement, okay? Um, I know my immune system is old now. I know I need to get it up there, and that's exactly what beta-glucan does for me. Let me tell you about life extension. I got to thinking. Uh, life extension can do any test. Let's say you want an HIV test. Let's say you want a pregnancy test. Let's say you want a cholesterol test. You call the people at life extension, their doctors set that up for you. You go into a lab, I'm in a tiny town and there are two of these labs in this town. So they've got a deal with the biggest labs in the United States. You know what I want, John, what you and I need to go get done is we need an antibody titer, anti-COVID, anti-SARS-2, COVID-2 um, test. We should just call Life Extension. Go to the, no kidding, we ought to do it in lieu of lunch one day. We'll just go up the road, uh, would they take Antibodies would be in our blood, so they take our blood, centrifuge it down, pull off the bu uh, leave the buffy coat, leave the packed red cells, pull off the plasma or the serum, and see if we have it. We both had it. We know we've had it, uh, and see where our antibody 
uh, tighter is. So are you paying? <laughs> but you guys, this, I, I want to read you some, some stuff I brought in today. And then I'll get to these other things. We need to talk to my friend with gout. Vaccine passports are a bad idea. I almost fell out of my chair. This a doctor has been publishing in one of my medical newsletters. And I just want to tell you what he, and this was today. <clears throat> COVID-19 uh, debates have reached a new milestone, vaccine passports. A vaccine passport is three things. First, it's a non-forgeable record that documents sars covid 2 vaccination. Non-forgeable means it's likely to be digital and not on a paper slip. Second, it ties the status only to you. This means it must include a photo or a fingerprint to ensure that the bearer is actually the vaccinated person. You with me? Third, it's a gatekeeper. <clears throat> Some entity, such as government or private industry, must use it to deny access to some place or service. Here I provide an in-depth policy analysis of domestic vaccine passports and find many reasons that they're a bad idea. Would you guys like me to post that? Why don't I post that? Uh, John, remind me as we lock up here tonight to post that when I get home. I think you'll find this fascinating. Gatekeeping. I don't get this, folks. I don't get it. While we're talking about that, let me, let me first cover gout and then I'll get on to your questions. I'm so sorry. I love reading about this. Is, uh, this guy's name is Anton von Leeuwenhoek, 1620s. He's an uneducated guy who grinds monoculars so people can read newspapers as we age. Our vision gets worse, same in 1600, 1500. So they figured out if you take sand and water and make glass and grind it down, uh, you can make monoculars back then and read a newspaper or whatever you're doing back then. The guy's name is Anton van Leeuwenhoek, okay? He first discovered what he called little beasts. His first uh, uh, microscope is, I don't know, some museum. I saw it online. It's just hilarious. But guess what? He's grinding these glasses. He's making glass, grinding them. He sets one of them on the sink or where he's running water, probably a hose. I wonder what they did 500 years ago. At any rate, and he looks underneath and the water is moving. He was the first guy that identified pathogens. And not necessarily pathogens, but germs, good or bad germs. He called them little beasts. He later visualized uric acid crystals uh, in, in the tissues of people with gout. So he went from a glass grinder, probably earning you know, a dollar a year, uh, to a guy making a dollar a month when he begins realizing, wow, when you take blood out and look at look at these little beasts crawling around in the blood, platelets, etc. Today, doctors believe that gout is caused by the breakdown of certain foods we call purines. Okay, these purines, they contend, break down into waste substances called uric acid, which can cause gout, kidney stones, and other t uh, tissue problems. Van Leeuwenhoek described the appearance of uric acid crystalline. The first written description of gout dates back to 2600 BC when Egyptians noted gouty arthritis in the big toe. Around 400 BC, the Greek physician Hippocrates commented on gout. Okay? So what are we told? Uh, gout. We are told to avoid, and folks, this is, where, this is where the medical community and I differ. Avoid wild game like venison. Duck and beef. Tuna, sardines, codfish, scallops, trout, just to name a few. Stay away from these things. What? Sweetbreads, liver, kidneys, thymus glands in meat. High fat and high sugar diets, they're getting so close. Alcohol, bingo, they hit it. High fructose corn sweeteners, they hit it. The rest of the stuff, where do they come up with this? Gout and diabetes. <clears throat> Okay, thanks, John. Oh, my shirt? This, do you remember when I used to wear this? How old is this shirt? That shirt, John, you were working with me when we bought it. Um, it's probably 15, 20 years yeah, old. I don't think so. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, but it feels good. It still feels good. Dr. Witt in 1788 observed that people with diabetes commonly had gout. 1954, Dr. Griffiths discovered that uric acid causes gout in animals. But I mean, it's so fascinating to me. Just he discovers that uric acid causes uh, uh, diabetes in animals. 1963, Dr. Svlia discovers that brewer's yeast, in addition to making beer, also made uric acid. You ever heard of gout being called the beer drinker's disease in the 50s? My dad had horrible gout. He was a big beer drinker. 1990, Dr. Coleman discovered that mice fed only a 10% diet of brewer's yeast developed diabetes. Folks, the genius isn't going to be the pro You see him on TV all the time, stethoscope, a paid actor, or a real doctor, saying gout. There's new colchicine. There's new medications for gout. Gout is caused by uric acid. That's not the genius. Rote memorization in medical school. The genius is going to be the person that steps forward and says, what causes the uric acid? Well, we don't know. The human body makes it. I'll never forget Dr. A.V. Costantini, my dear friend. I attended that conference in Canada, you know, 100 years ago. And he had an envelope. He reaches into this brown leather briefcase, pulls out a white envelope, and he says, Doctors, I have $1,000 cash in here. He opens it and shows it to everybody that I am going to give to any one of you if you can prove to me that the human body makes uric acid. Now, hold on. Every smack test... You get a CBC, a complete blood count with differential, and you get a SMAC 12, SMAC 18. Now there's probably a SMAC 185. Um, but it's a chemistry test. And every one of them says uric acid. Zero to four is kind of normal. Anything over four, the doctor says, is your big toe hurt? Do you have arthritis? Yeah, you have gouty arthritis. And so doctors believe that the human body makes uric acid. He said, I have been offering this $1,000 for 20 years, and I'm not a penny poorer. I carry it in my briefcase. I'll give it as my, I lecture across America, across the world. Here's from Germany. I will give anybody that can prove to me the human body makes uric acid this thousand. Are you with me on this? What makes uric acid? Brewer's yeast. Okay. Uh, this just, this just blows my mind. Despite all of this data, diabetes organizations like diabetes.org continue to teach that most, pe most people with diabetes can have a moderate amount of alcohol. Oh, they can have a beer or two a day. Do you get it? Do you see why, do you have the ching? Do you see why we're in the trouble we're in today? Amazing, amazing, amazing. Okay, quickly, quickly, quickly. Got that done. Let me just say this. Vax passports are a bad idea. I couldn't find a number. I've had people who know the internet looking for this number. I can't find it. I wish I could. Vaccines could be approved for children before school starts in the fall. Are you high-fiving them? Good for them. Man, they're going to have, they care. Um, and then they go on to tell the companies that the FDA is going to approve vaccines in in small children. Year of COVID, everything we thought we knew was wrong. Folks, um, the stats I wanted are this, that uh, I couldn't get. Oh no, this was, this was something quite different. It's probably down there. How vulnerable are our young children, say, 14 and under, to this vaccine, or to this uh, disease. And I learned that uh, quite a few children have had a positive test result. Go with me on that, okay? Quite a few children have had a positive test result. I have learned that, uh, oh, a few hundred thousand kids have actually been hospitalized with this. And the statistic that blew me away was children represent 0, 0.0 to 0 0.03 of the deaths of COVID. 
I can't find how many children have died from COVID. It's amazing. I do know that VAERS, the vaccine association that keeps track of how many deaths and injuries there are, mortality and morbidity, um, they are, they have taught, here it is. They taught us, this is the U.S. Agency for Health, Care, Research and Quality in the year 2010. And they say, and I need to quote them, here are the results. Adverse events from drugs and vaccines are common but underreported a decade ago. Although 25% of ambulatory patients experience an adverse drug event, a quarter of us, less than 0.3% of these adverse drugs and one in 13% of serious events are ever reported to the FDA. Likewise, fewer than 1%, fewer than 1% of vaccine adverse events are reported. Do we need to vaccinate children for a disease that doesn't really exist in them? Are we stating that the vaccine test, the PCR, polymerase chain reaction, COVID tests, were 100% accurate or did we learn through the years you've been watching this with me, they weren't really very accurate at all. But we sure had a lot of positives. I still, to this day, don't believe I know someone who has passed from COVID. It's tragic, tragic what's going on. And I sure as heck don't know a child. Maybe you do. And that's tragic. You always need to weigh, any doctor, any FDA, CDC will tell you, in every procedure, you always need to weigh the benefits against the risks. If, let's say, a hundred children in the U.S. have died of COVID because there were comorbidities, cancer or something like that, do we then need to vaccinate um, 60,000, 80,000 children before they can go back into school? With a vaccine that is experimental, I can't answer that. We each need to ask ourselves that question. Um, so I'll expound on that here in the coming weeks. Please never let me be your COVID go-to guy. I think I know what COVID is all about. And I, I think a series of mistakes have led to it. Our doctors are good. There are those who contend that vaccine is life-saving. It's saving so many lives, you just can't believe it. Um, I don't know. I don't really know. So don't go to me as your go-to COVID guy. When it comes to things fungus, like Harvard saying, whoops, some cancers aren't cancer at all. They're fungus. And many research papers say pulmonary mycoses mimic pulmonary cancer, lung cancer, okay? Yeah, I listen to Mike, uh, Mike and Mark in the morning, 660, the answer. Jack asks, is it pos Jack asks... Is it possible that C. diff is caused by a biotoxin or metabolite made by bacteria? Could be, because there are, they're not mycotoxins, but they're bacterial toxins that are made. Um, Jack, very good point. Certainly could be. I just find it fascinating, that headline that says, is fungus playing a role? We're finding this in C. diff. What role does, that isn't definitive, of course. That's conjecture. But it's still research, a small study, maybe a couple hundred people. And they find in the, in the blood of people with this disease, uh, not only excessive bacteria, but fungus. What does that mean? Okay. And then you have to understand if we're throwing, Jack, antibiotic after antibiotic after antibiotic, Leviquid, you know, all these antibiotics of people, um, are we creating fungal growth in their inside? And the answer is yeah. Uh, Roar, can I recommend anything that is a natural anti-inflammatory. Um, when I had inflammation problems, this is now long ago, I turned to something called curry or curcumin. Today it's curcumin, uh, Life Extension has it, a lot of good companies have it. Uh, Life Extension has something called uh, curcumin elite, which is a product I've taken, it's wonderful. You can almost, I could, almost watch the inflammation go down. Um,
hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of patients in that five years I worked with David and the other doctors I saw. I was the guy who saw in LA with Dr. Godshock, I was the guy who saw amazing things happen with chronic sinus problems when we ground up Nystatin, put it into a nasal spray, the pharmacist downstairs did it. They didn't need their allergy shots. And so my eyes were awoken to fungal problems long ago. Um, once these patients were starting to you know, get better, um, I then, I talked to Bob, the pharmacist at that time, and said, what is this drug used for? Well, my statin is already a 30-year-old, you know, this was in 1970, so it was already a 30-year-old medication. Now it's pushing, you know, 70, 80 years old. And he said, it's used to cure the gut of yeast overgrowth. Bob, how does yeast get down there? I'm a traditional guy. I thought yeast grew in the vaginal tract only. And he, thank you, bud, he set me straight. No, no, Doug, uh, people who take a lot of antibiotics, you are born with yeast in your belly. You're kidding. Uh, no, and it can ignite when you take antibiotics. And Nystatin was developed. You see, did I stand on the shoulder of giants? He was the nicest guy. He drove a 1941 Chevy to work black Chevy that was just beautiful. And uh, so he was the one that kind of interested me in all this. So Nystatin was invented because people who take lots of antibiotics have lots of tummy problems, bloating, belching, di uh, 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 indigestion, uh, diarrhea, etc. Constipation mostly. And he said this was really a, a great drug. Then I began to wonder, I, uh, you know, nobody can fix cancer. Nobody can fix diabetes. We just medicate these people from womb to tomb. So hurry up and diagnose them and get them in. That's the way it felt to me. Maybe that's not the way it is, but that's the way it felt and feels to me. We are in such a hurry to get a pediatric visit done so we can tell what problems that baby has. I'm sorry, just the way I feel, okay? Um, so a good, every time I take an antifungal supplement, I have a fungal rash that may indicate that you're taking way too much. You're encouraging a Herxheimer or a die-off. Um, if nothing happened, I'd say, okay, it may not be fungus, but if you exacerbate a dermal condition by taking an antifungal, something's trying to come out. If you take caprylic acid, I think one of the best antifungals is caprylic acid, and you take one caprylic acid and bang, you end up itching, you know, you're in the shower in the morning and you're just itching like crazy. That darn caprylic acid did that. What I would try is cutting it in quarters or grinding it up and taking a little tiny bit under your tongue and seeing a tinier dose, always talk to your doctor about this, but seeing if a little tiny dose uh, doesn't create a breakthrough. Now, Doug, when I take a quarter pill every day uh, my, I feel so good with it, my stomach's better, I don't break out on my skin, and then in three weeks, take a whole caprylic acid. Darn, here it comes again. Get back to a tinier dose and build up tolerance over an extended period of time. Such a good question. <clears throat> yeah, Floristore, good for C. diff. I would use uh, a, a prebiotic, a probiotic, a postbiotic, and I can tell you that's what Dr. Ohiris is. They pay for sponsorship, not here, but on my television show. Uh, if I had C. diff, yeah, I think one of the ways of repairing damage done by antibiotics is a changed diet. Uh, I think another one is a good probiotic, so you're on the right track, uh, Janice. That's, that's what I would do. Good for you. Sandy asked, Doug, what would you take with swollen glands in the neck? Already on your Kaufman diet. Love your show. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, listen, if I had swollen nodules in my neck, I'd go to a doctor. It could be something. Let me read you something. <clears throat> One of the characteristics of, how do I put that back? Breast cancer, breast cancer, breast cancer. Hope at last. <clears throat> One of the characteristics of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the glands in the neck or the glands under the arms or top of the legs 
becoming inflamed, swollen. And uh, these doctors address this <clears throat> carcinogenic fungi found in tobacco. Wow. <clears throat> Chapter 10. I just want to read you this. Penicillin and other antibiotics cause lymphoma. Sometimes you see swollen nodes in lymphoma. Penicillin and other antibiotics cure bacterial infections. No, no, that's not what they said. Penicillin and other antibiotics cause lymphoma in humans. Doctors Bernstein and Ross in 1992, in their study of prior medication use and the health history as risk factors for this disease, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, found that greater than or equal to two months of treatment with penicillin or other antibiotics were associated with a significant increase in the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What? 30 years ago this was published? Does your oncologist know this? Guarantee it. The answer is no. Guarantee it. Not bad people, not smart people. This is 30 years old. But doctor, what caused these in my neck? Well, we don't know. You have lymphoma. Sometimes the immune system fights itself and you grow lumps on your neck. Be careful. I would, <clears throat> I would rule out often our lymph nodes swell when we have an infection. Do lymph nodes swell when we have a bacterial infection? Make book on it. Do they swell when we have a fungal infection? Make book on it that nobody reads. Okay? <clears throat> Such good questions. Love trying to help you guys. <clears throat> John, you make really good tea. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, Sally, okay, my brother recently passed from lung cancer. Wow, Sally, I'm sorry. Although he had been using the dog wormer, fenbendazole, his tumors were shrinking and not spreading. For some reason, he chose to do another round of chemo. He had terrible side effects from the chemo, which was actually the cause of his death. If you have cancer, for sure try fenbendazole, which can be purchased without a prescription. I will never recommend chemo or radiation. Boy, that hits you in the gut. So John and I, you, I wish you guys could know my history. How many people who had tremendous results with what we were doing over at the hospital with those doctors. They brought in a friend, a loved one with cancer. John and I have three or four of these that we have known through the years. They do really, really well when using alternative methods. Somebody convinces them they need just one more chemo, just one more shot of radiation. I don't know, you know, we're, we're all responsible for the decisions we make. And uh, fenbendazole, I'm, I'm so excited about that. They're using it, well, if they're using it, they're probably in trouble in COVID, but I read that it had great response in a year ago with COVID patients and works well for cancer. And it's a parasite and fungus parasitizes man. Sally, I'm really sorry to hear that. I'm just broken hearted about that. But he was responsible for his own decision. And if you believe like I believe, you'll be having fun with him before too long. So we're all, <clears throat> Yes, Pam, I've read many articles. Uh, Mulan is wonderful for lungs. Any plant, of course, has antimicrobial properties. That may be one of the reasons it is so good. Elaine says, I had C. diff and I cured it with garlic and probiotics. Do you hear? Can you, can you absorb all of this? I mean, it's just so exciting. Do you think her doctor recommended garlic and probiotics or antibiotics? And let me, okay, I need to address that. I wanted to be a doctor after I got back from Vietnam. I really, man, what I worked in operating rooms and saw things that probably in the field, I saw things and did things our doctors today don't have that experience. I didn't want it. I was only 20 years old, but I got it. 
Um, I was so angry that I couldn't maintain a 4.0, I'd be lucky to maintain a 2.0 uh, GPA because when I got back from Vietnam, I learned there's an opposite sex and surf. There's, we lived in California at the ocean, play it all right, and you just walk right down to the waves and if you get a stick and stand on it, you'll become addicted very, very quickly. Uh, and so I was really, and I shook my finger up above, due north. Why couldn't I be a doctor? If I were a doctor today, I would be teaching you about a new C. diff antibiotic that is going to help. And if you mix it with a beer, it's going to be the greatest thing in the world. You know, that's exactly, I wasn't meant to be a doctor. Um, <laughs> Elaine had a condition that kills over 2,000 people a month, 500 a week, only in America die from C. diff. So she found something called garlic and something called probiotics. Poof. She got it controlled. But if I were Elaine's doctor, I'd say, Elaine, you're on your own. You know, those things, they don't get approved like drugs do. Uh, supplements are nonsense. They hurt a lot of people. Really? Show me that data. Yeah, let's do the data on drugs one day. This will, don't, I won't do it. I know it, I won't do it. Thank you, Elaine, and good for you. You took charge of your own health. That's what the, that's the thread, that's the common thread of this show. Learn in the past 50 years what I have learned. I went through periods where I didn't exercise at all. When the kids were born, we got this great picture, John, I'll have to show you sometime. We're washing Berkeley, or no, Berkeley, my grandson. We're washing my son in the sink, a little tiny guy, about yay big, and somebody, it was probably Ruth's brother, was standing back and took a picture. You should see my gut. That was 40 years ago. You should, I had a gut on me. I was a beer drinking guy. I was stressed out. Uh, kids, you know, men, when we have children, do you remember this, John, when John was born? The thought in the newspapers, LA Times and all the newspapers, they used to say it costs a million dollars to raise a child. And I have two. How in the world you live like I've got to work two jobs, I've got to do this, I've got you. Men and women go through different, you know, concerns. And man, I was going through that big time with the boys, but I was apparently eating everything wrong. I knew about this by then, but I threw caution to the wind. I was in my 30s and uh, threw caution to the wind. Uh, good for you, Elaine. You took it upon yourself to help yourself. Now, I always think it's a good idea to. If you live in a condo and there's a nurse living there, talk to her. If you go to church and there's a doctor or a, a chiropractor there, talk to him. Get a team of people around you. Hey, I have C. diff and I'm thinking about swallowing a lot of garlic, deodorized garlic, and taking a good line of probiotics for a couple of months. What do you guys think? I like that. I like that. There's so many controversies around this, Josh, but uh, Joshua, I understand exactly. Do you believe that a mostly carnivore diet will meet most mineral? No, they say that, um, you know, if you're a carnivore, okay, whether you're a carnivore, a vegan, a vegetarian, a Kaufman guy, I recommend a daily multivitamin, okay? Because some people do great on a carnivore diet. Others do horribly. And there was a guy I interviewed on the radio. What was his name? Um, the eat right for your blood type, Dr. Diadamo. He was great, very entertaining on TV. But I never bought that science. I didn't, A positive, which I am, it was on my dog tag, uh, A positive, so I should eat this way. And when I ate that way, I felt horrible. You got a 20, it's a throw of a dice. You got a 25% chance in being right. You got A, B, and A, B, and O. You know, so you got a 25% chance of being right when you write a book about this. Um, I, uh, Joshua, thank you. Uh, good to hear from you. If you're eating a carnivore diet, or any diet, take a good multi. Uh, stack the odds in your favor. If it's deficient in certain things, and you type them out here, which is really good, um, make up for that. If you feel good, when you find a good horse in Texas, you ride it. If you find a diet, man, I feel good on this diet. 
you know, take a take a good. They're not expensive anymore. Ten, twenty bucks uh, for a good uh, multi supplement every day. Dean would like to know about Time Out. Is it a cream? John, remind me to call them tomorrow. I'll bet they are getting orders that are sensational and wonder where they're coming from. Uh, Time Out is a Time Out is Time Oil. T H Y M E. It's time oil, so it's a, uh, the cure is in the cupboard, as Dr. Cass Ingram says. It's a spice. They squeeze. They get some oil. They dilute it with water. The stuff is nuts good. Eczema, skin problems. Uh, my dad used to call them huni fashtugis. You know, when you got a little huni fashtugi on your skin, we didn't have time out there. It's cheap. $18 per bottle full. Get some cotton pads and rub it on, you know, wherever you have a huni fashtugi. Um, but it's not a cream. I don't believe it is yet. It's a very, very functional, very good uh, antifungal time. Inductive pleasure. I like that name. Doctors get mad when you ask them questions. Um, gosh, I got in trouble years ago on TV. The gall the gall of someone to charge you a fee and then to get upset with you. The gall. I would last three seconds in a doctor's office like that. I went, my wife goes to a chiropractor, a neat guy. I went to him, oh, it's when, John, it was when my push-ups went from 75 to 125 a day. Um, my lower back, my shoulders, so I went to this guy, very nice guy. Um, and uh, had another appointment in, I don't know, five days. I went back, and uh, I walked in, and the girl said, oh, no, 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 you can't come in here without a mask on. And I said, okay. Uh, do I have to? I was in the other day. Yeah, you have to. From now on, you have to. Okay, bye. I got to be comfortable in my skin. I, I acknowledge and I respect that that group felt uncomfortable with my presence if I had COVID, a cough, or something. They don't know my history. So I understand that, but I get to choose. I'm not going down easy, folks. I get to choose where I shop. If Delta Airlines won't take me, I'll fly in other airlines. If they won't, I'll get a car and I'll drive. That's just who I am. I will move mountains to see that I end up the comfortable one. I'm paying the fee, just who I am. So. Good, 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 good. Yeah, doctors get mad. Uh, personally, I would find another one. The second a physician raised his voice to me, I'm out of there so fast, it would make his head swim. Okay, so this is Gary. Hey, Gary, on Facebook. I spend $500 a month for health insurance for my wife. I'm on Medicare. I don't trust any... <laughs> Tell it like it is. I don't trust any of the doctors that are preferred providers and have learned more by listening to Doug and reading his books and following his diet. Uh, so that's, I'm gonna charge you 400 a month. You just send me that 400 a month. I want for nothing we have indoor plumbing. Um, Gary, that makes me so happy. Elaine, that makes me so happy. All I've ever done, Mom always said I was really good every Christmas. I'd get Herbie the Love Bug puzzle, 400 pieces. You put Herbie the Love Bug. I've always built puzzles. Keeps my mind really sharp, and they're extremely logical, right? You got corners, they go in first. You got borders. You got white, you got red. You know, I just put it all together. I've always done that. And that's what I do in my adult life until God tells me that I can't do this anymore. Um, this, remember John, when you were 65, that was a lot of years ago. You got that notice from Medicare. I put it on television. I took the notice and put it on television. It said, uh, Mr. John, uh, We've noticed for two years, you haven't been to the doctor. You haven't even been to a urologist to have your prostate checked. John and I just roll and roll and roll. And I don't, since I've known you, you haven't. Uh, so that's what, 16 years. But it's funny the way they encourage you to go to a doctor. And I remember 
you know, this is back when I met, oh, what was his name? Down in Santa Monica, he had the Nathan Pritikin. And I met all these uh, really fun people who would go on to become famous, and I didn't, but who needs that? Uh, and I remember Nathan telling me, no, no, if you have heart disease, you got to eat a lot of, you know, you got to eat this way. And I'd go watch mom and dad. I'd go home on the weekends and spend time with them. They didn't follow anything that my alternative doctors were saying. And I did. I had to make a choice because I watched dad suffer horribly with symptoms from head to toe. And I don't think you can drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes and eat, uh, you know, the way dad ate. Wonderful man, wonderful man. What a great man, five children. And live a healthy life. And dad loved doctors with a capital L. Um, when HMOs came along, dad joined an HMO at work there, uh, joined an HMO, and he would go to doctors all the time. And he ended up losing a leg, um, then losing a hip, then getting a pacemaker, then going after drug after drug after drug they would put him on. And then I said goodbye to dad. I didn't see that's not to me logical. It's logical to watch his lifestyle and say, okay, I better do something about that. But remember what you and I learned in 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade. The, the hand we're dealt is our genetic makeup. Mom's egg, dad's sperm. No aces in there, right? Oh boy, we got fives. What I didn't know is something called epigenetics. In medicine, epi means on or upon. Genetics has little to do. We used to think that breast cancer was linked to grandma or definitely mom or very definitely your sister. We had no idea it's not like that at all. Epigenetics says Doug watched mom and dad, loved them, was there with them when they died, loved them more than he loved oxygen, but he opted 50 years ago to do, well, 40 years ago. I told you the picture of me washing Evan when he was a little baby with my gut hanging out. It wasn't a big gut, but I'll bet it was, um, it was probably 34, and I was a small guy. That picture changed me dramatically. So I've always believed in being responsible for my choices, okay? You know, you've always got to answer for your choices, always. Good, bad, indifferent. Watch or remember mom and dad Watch your brothers and sisters, and I work out on a regular basis, and I don't eat what uh, an old guy normally eats uh, because I'm having a really good time. I think the ticker is working great and the brain's working great, so I get a reprieve, God willing, for a few years to teach this. I love teaching this. I think many of you could become independent. You are free the moment you realize you're Gary. You're free the moment you realize, I can, Friday night, I can have two bottles of beer, I can eat a candy bar and eat half a pie and eat a pizza, and I know with certainty when I wake up Saturday, I'm going to have constipation, then diarrhea, I'm going to get pimples all over my body, I'm going to be angry with my spouse. You're free the moment you realize that's your choice. Most Americans have no idea because their doctors don't have an idea. Okay, uh, Esther says, can you, lose, uh, or can you lose hearing after taking an antibiotic for an ear infection? Sure. During the time, if it's a bacterial ear infection, uh, during the time you're on the antibiotic, it may plug the auditory canal. Um, but if it's not better in a day or two, I'd go back to the doctor and talk with him about that. Can Malazia, Nalia, I love that name, can Malazia be confused with shingles? Um, really a good question. Really, I, go to PubMed, pubmed.gov. It's a government organization. There are hundreds of thousands of research papers. Type in Malazia and shingles, and I'll bet you a paper or two will pop up where researchers have found that Malazia being a skin fungus Oh, and shingles, smallpox, um, have some correlation. I don't know.
I don't know. But because shingles grows on the skin, and that's where Malazia lives, uh, there really may be. What a good question. Thank you. <clears throat> Michelle asks, I have breast cancer. I'm a breast cancer survivor. Congratulations for almost a year. Wonderful. I now have a complex cyst in the other breath, breast. Anything I can do to turning it into cancer? Uh, often, Michelle, the therapies for breast cancer are some chemo and radiation. And uh, if you've gone through all that now and you're well, um, I would opt. Listen, the oncologist and your own doctor and your family have to be scared when, oh no, here we go again. Um, I would ask for a, a mycology biopsy. I would ask if they can do, and they probably can, a, uh, uh, what do they call it, gosh, whew, a, uh, where you put a, you put a needle in and you withdraw. It's a biopsy? No, uh, it's a needle biopsy, but it's a, boot, do, do. It, you guys know where I'm, what I'm talking about. In a breast, there were several cases reported where they did a, Oh, it's in the scientific literature. Uh, they go in with a small needle, 26 gauge, and they go into that cyst in the other breast, pull off some of the liquid, and they can test it for fungus. The doctors who have done that, I reported three or four cases. The doctors who have done that have found that that's a fungal cyst, and then the women survived by being on antifungals, and I'm sure they didn't know back then about diet. Oh, come on, what's that called? Somebody type that to me real quick. Yes, fine needle aspiration, FNA. John, way to go. FNA, fine needle aspirate. Everything, you know, has three or four letters. Fine needle, that's what I would do, Michelle. I would ask the doctor to do a fine needle aspiration on that. Or if he or, she, he or she says no, then I would go ahead and get a biopsy and split the sample. Half goes to the cancer detection, other half goes to mycology. Mycology is fungal studies. Let them look for aspergillus or foma or alternaria or candida because fungi grow in a sac, just like tumors do. And if that one comes back, yeah, fungus and mycotoxins. There's a lab called Real Time Labs out here in Richardson, Texas that uh, does these types of tests. A pathologist, a friend of mine, and he does a lot of these. Uh, but find a my, I would find a mycology lab. The doctor should have no problem splitting that sample, sending half of it to that lab and half of it to a mycology lab where they test for fungi and their poisons. And if they find fungi and their poisons in that cyst, there's going to be a whole lot of questions, isn't there? Wow, wonder what was in the other one. Okay. Uh, by the way, let me sidebar here and, and teach women. At 10 years ago when I lectured, uh, a breakthrough had happened. In one year, I believe, science had found, big science, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, Journal of the American Medical Association had found that three things, dramatically some of them, increased the risk of women's breast cancer. One was alcohol of any kind. And yet every doctor, oh, have a glass of wine a night. That's not going to hurt you. Some women. I think it does hurt. Number two, antibiotics. Duh, they are mycotoxins, and mycotoxins cause cancer. And third was starchy carbohydrates. I tend to think of grains, but potatoes, rice, things of that sort, increases your risk of breast cancer. Mycotoxins, 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 fungus. So just think that way. I hope that helps. <clears throat> oh, no, Raylene. Oh, this is a tough show to do. A good friend diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer four weeks ago, just passed away yesterday. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. No one, no one would have thought fungus. No way. And yet there was a paper that said, yeah, we're seeing pancreatic cancer. Fungus tends to promote it. Does it cause it? We don't know. What causes pancreatic cancer? We don't know. Then let's put all these patients on the Kaufman diet and put them on Sporinox, say 200 milligrams twice a day, to see if in a few weeks they're not doing better, their tumor markers are getting better. I'm so sorry. Ugh. What causes pancreatitis? So Viola, the itis, 
uh, as opposed to uh, pancreatic cancer, itis means inflammation or swelling. Uh, so it, it would be a mycotoxin can cause an itis. What makes bread itis? When you take flour and you mix it with water and you put it in the oven, 350, nothing, becomes hard. Unless you put some yeast in there and then it becomes itis. What makes bread inflamed? Yeast. Could that make my pancreas inflamed? You bet it can. And according to that paper I read you today, it probably does. Good questions. <clears throat> I think, uh, what, uh, Lillian, thank you. I rotate my daily multi. I love Frank Jordan's. I've used that so often. I love um, uh, life extensions. I rotate those. I use the two a day with life extension and Frank's, uh, uh, pro, uh, his uh, daily multi. Um, I'll take that for a couple of months, then rotate it and begin taking another one for a couple of months. But there's so many good ones out there. So many good ones. The B vitamins tend to be potently antifungal, as does cholecalciferol, vitamin D3, as does zinc, and so many of the ingredients. Not only are you making up for nutrient deficiencies, if in fact they exist, and I know I eat an organic diet almost all the time, so I'm not worried about that, but they're all antifungal, or most of them are antifungal. Good daily multi. Uh, Kathleen, thank you. Let's see, my son-in-law got the vaccine, even though it wasn't mandatory in the school district where he is vice principal. He's the one with the parotid gland tumors. Oh boy, I'm scared to death for him and my daughter. They're only 42 years old. Once again, we must stand on the decisions we make. That wasn't your decision. You probably got to share with him your thoughts on it, but it wasn't his thoughts. And folks, we're seeing a lot of uh, people who are trusting, just across the board, very trusting, good people. Uh, and I, as I opened this venue three years ago, the first thing I told you was, I'm not a very trusting guy when it comes to medicine. Okay? I'm so sorry, but you know what? From your mouth to God's ears. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Boy, are they, this is so good. Yeah, Nail, you already asked that. The fungus could be, yeah. Oh, Lynn, such a good question. Any recommendations for those who have mold illness and have mycotoxins in the body? Unlike bacteria, unlike protozoa, unlike viruses, requires two things with fungus. Fungus off-gas poisons once inside your body, and they're parasitic. So they'll get inside your body and share your nutrients with, uh, with your cells. Two things. You must kill or stop. It's called fungicidal to kill fungus or fungistatic to stop fungus. You must stop or kill fungus. Drugs do that, by the by. So do many supplements. Okay? Um, and then you must stop it from progressing. Cancer metastasizes, fungus disseminates. It's the same thing. So you must stop fungus from metastasizing. It is pumped indiscriminately by the heart, once in the blood vessel, to weak organs in your body. You gotta starve it. As long as you give it pasta and bread and alcohol and the list is, you know, grain, cereal, etc., it's gonna love you. It's gonna continue growing. Sometimes when you stop feeding it immediately, boy, some people get sick. They feel really bad. Also, when you start taking Nystatin or Diflucan or Sporinox, these drugs that the doctor when I'm gone, mark my words, those drugs will be antibiotics. It's all cyclical. Antibiotics have had their 90-year run. I think antifungals are next. And yes, they too will be abused. We don't know very much in science. Okay. Um, wow. Gosh, listen to this. Teresa, I have had several members of my family that died from COVID. Some were young and healthy. I'm sorry. Uh, Anna Marie, my son is 15. He had COVID. 
and had no idea until he went to school for a physical and he had blood work. He had antibodies last September 2020. We will not be getting the vaccine. I'm, I'll gladly go to jail first. <laughs> I have my 15 year old last one uh, to go in school. At three years left, he may never see the inside of a school. I don't care, they won't be wearing a mask six hours a day. None of this makes sense. If there's a way to get over this virus, why do we have a vax? I don't understand, or maybe I do. Um, how did we get over the worst one a hundred years ago now? The global pandemic, the flu of 1918. <clears throat> do you remember that? How many people died? Do you remember what they finally did to get rid of it? We didn't have a vaccine. We began putting people out in the sun. I just said cholecalciferol, vitamin D, vitamin D from the sun is antifungal, antimicrobial. And yet what bothers me is when this whole thing started, stay home, wear a mask in your bathroom when you're showering, and it didn't go that far. Stay home, don't go out, don't let other people in your home. When 100 years earlier, that advice hurt people. And a hundred years later, they're giving that same advice. I'm confused. To this day, I'm confused. Thank you. Okay, the, uh, Debbie, uh, this is good. Several weeks ago, you kindly answered a question I had about my 30-year-old daughter that had breakouts and sores on her face. Now, she has been to, uh, to patient first two times, wonder what that, it must be a, a doc in the box clinic, two times and two different antibiotics, now a dermatologist and a third antibiotic, still sores that look like impetigo. Doctor said it's acne and this med will take care of it. Wrong. Should they do a culture? Okay, thank you. So fortuitous that we're doing this show today. Malazia, this dermatophyte that grows on the skin, can infect the face. Malazia is a fungus and it mimics acne. Fungal acne, you guys, is real. Oh no, they wouldn't know that. Medical school would never teach that. Everything is an antibiotic deficiency. Sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> listen, I talked, I talked, one of the doctors, we had a woman who was sick, we helped her get better. She came in one time with her son and she yeah, was 15, 16 years old, cute kid. And on the way out, she pulls me aside and says, Doug, I wanted you to see him. See how bad that acne is? Cystic acne, the doctors called it. He's been on every antibiotic in the world. Now he's constipated. He's having horrible, horrible health problems. Such is the life of someone who goes to a dermatologist or a doctor with acne. You're going on an antibiotic because they learned that antibiotics are what's used for acne counterproductive if this is malazia infection, which I think, now they say rarely it's malazia. I don't know. How many antibiotics have these kids been on? How good is it for their health? Some of these mycotoxins are endocrine disruptors. I mean, what you see, folks, to me, is so out of control. I'll go back to how I started this show. In 1996, they were saying, you better stop this indiscriminate prescribing of antibiotics think they're going to stop it? They're not evil. They don't know their antibiotics are putting people in hospitals, not only with C. diff, but with cancers and serious diseases, serious gut problems. They're, anti they're not going to stop. That's why I opened this shop. If you take nothing home today other than be careful, ask your doctor for what we call a differential diagnosis. I know that looks like acne, Doc. But acne, as we all know, is a bacterial disease. And she's now been on what? 79 antibiotics. Do you think we could get some nice statin to change diet? Let me give you the good news. Okay, if I had cystic acne so bad, I would really, prostate cancer, mm -hmm. and colorectal, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the books are, you know, honest. 
Wow, I hope that helps. Oh, guys. Oh, Anna Marie, my 17-year-old has terrible acne. It's very healthy, works out, cleans his face. Noxema. Uh, buy him a face scrubber. Personally, wouldn't do the medicines. Me, personally, wouldn't do the medicines. My oldest went through the same thing. He's 24 with clear skin. Hope he doesn't... Uh, I know it doesn't look nice, but I think it's hormonal. Okay. Uh, hopefully, Doug has a good solution. I'll be listening. All the best. Uh, there was a 24-year-old kid that we interviewed here 20 years ago. He wrote the five-day acne reversal, and he talked about uh, eating green apples. Yeah. I think they just look up apple, apple diet or The apple diet for acne. Yeah, the apple diet for acne. And remember, John, we had people calling in saying, oh, yeah. man, Three that years. works. Yeah. yeah, yeah, really good. Uh, Donna says, Doug, please help me. I have a serious scalp itching and bleeding constantly. I believe it's caused by an overgrowth of yeast. What do you recommend? Donna, do you wear a hat ever? Don't. When you get out of the shower or the bath in the morning, if your hair is wet, blow dry it thoroughly. And then uh, I would use a little, uh, two, three drops of Melaleuca tea tree oil uh, and massage it through your scalp. Then I'd probably blow dry again. Uh, this malazia can cause uh, seborrheic dermatitis, which is dandruff, and it can bleed. Now, if you wear a toboggan or a hat, not good, not good. Dry your hair thoroughly each time, you know, you're, you're out of the bath or shower. That's really important. And then put some kind of an antifungal timeout. Timeout's being used for acne. Timeout is antifungal. Timeout is $18 on Amazon. $18 is what I just bought it for a friend of mine. Um, Doug, uh, what nose spray for allergy and what would you recommend? Nettles, I love the herb nettles for allergy. I love going to a local health food store and getting honey from pollination in your neighborhood. If you live in Paducah, Kentucky, get honey from the bees in Paducah, Kentucky. Ronald Reagan used to have honey sent to Washington, D.C. from Santa Barbara, his ranch and that helped his allergies tremendously. Those bees are gonna drop the pollen that your, uh, uh, that your child is reacting to. Okay, and then I really like uh, several, uh, let's see, gosh, there's so many good nasal sprays on the market. Nutribiotic has a great one. Life Extension has great ones. Call, when you call Life Extension, tell them Doug sent you and they'll likely discount uh, products for you. Uh, my doctor, uh, her doctor, of course, told her to get Flonase. Uh, Doug, what is C. diff? Oh, go back and watch the beginning of this show. Uh, Diane, meet you at the dinner table one day, Doug. Mom had C. diff twice, then caught it, taking care of her. Dr. O'Hara's probiotics, gone. Didn't take long at all. Tiny spots on kidney frozen. Do I need more CAT scans? No biopsy done. Tiny spots on kidney. What are they, Barbara? Have they diagnosed them? Um, if I had tiny... You guys, fungus, if you're not taught in uh, radiology through medical school to realize what fungus looks like or to recognize it, what are those black spots? I don't know. Uh, what makes those lumps on my ovary? Well, I don't know. Think fungus. I'm just telling you, think fungus. Always talk to your doctor about this. I'm new here. I love this. Can you tell me the best place to start? If you will do me a favor, uh, what's the website, John? Live at knowthecause.com. Give me your name and your, uh, and your last name, important, and your mailing address, I'm going to send you a couple of books to help you get started. Um, just remind me that you were you know, a question today, and I promised you two books. Oh, identify yourself as male or female, because that'll make a difference in the book I sent you. See, Tony, does taking quality nutritional yeast cause yeast or fungus in your body? They say no, but I don't do any yeast. I don't do kombucha. I don't do kefir. I don't do alcohol. Fermented bacteria, I'm good at that. Fermented yeast, I'm not good at that. 
do you have any suggestion or no doctors in the states that treat ALS? Uh, tonight, Govinda, that's a pretty name. Um, tonight, type out multiple sclerosis, a chronic mycotoxicosis, question mark. MS and ALS are myelin sheath degenerating diseases. Watch what we wrote, 20, Dr. Holland and I wrote 20 years ago about multiple sclerosis, apply the same to ALS, work with a doctor, a naturopathic doctor that understands all this, and I think you'll do well. Wow. God bless you guys. Tell your friends, Tuesday, we'll be back at 3 p.m., and looking forward to bringing you a whole bunch more. This was fun. Thank you.